Okay, so our next speaker is a native Houstonian, uh, Wilson Lamb. I think he carries the Baylor College of Medicine uh, Sapphire card, <laughs> medical school, medpeds, cardiology, uh, EP fellowship, uh, electrophysiology fellowship, and is uh, practicing uh, where he trained uh, and very actively involved in not only adult, adult congenital heart disease, but also in the education at Baylor College of Medicine. And, and uh, Wilson's going to speak to us about bicuspid aortic valve and congenital aortic stenosis. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, I am tasked today in the next 15 minutes telling you everything you need to know about bicuspid aortic valves in 2017. I really want to take the growing literature and simplify it down into three things. You have to know that bicuspid aortic valves are a valvulopathy, and I'll briefly allude to the SBA prophylaxis guidelines. We're going to talk about why it's important, and even more important, because it's an aortopathy. There's some special circumstances you have to be aware of, including pregnancy. And then I'm going to round it off talking about heredity. So this is the exact topic that I speak to all of my patients about three things, valves, aorta, heredity. Now, before we get started in the huge body of literature, I'm going to give you guys a few resources to turn to. You can go to the 2008 Carol Warrens and the ACHD guidelines from the ACC AHA. There's been an update in the valve guidelines in 2014 as well as in 2017. There's a set of pediatric and uh, congenital heart cardiac catheterization guidelines we'll allude to. And then the 2010 aorta guidelines. If you have a little bit more time, these are two reviews. samsu has been uh, productive on both this New England Journal review article as well as the state-of-the-art Jack paper from the last uh, seven years. And each of these is about one page. These are about 10 pages. If you read that alone, you're going to be pretty caught up to speed on where we are, are with a, a bicuspid aortic valve. So let's start off with this 35-year-old patient. This 35-year-old patient came into the office complaining of fatigue. She was a uh, body mass index of about 33, and she had a systolic murmur, an early systolic click, and a soft diastolic murmur when she leaned forward. And this is the bicuspid aortic valve. It happens in roughly 1% to 2% of the population. Newer numbers say it's closer to 1.3%. I like saying 2% because of bicuspid aortic valve, and it helps me remember it. It's about a 3 to 4 uh, to 1 male to female ratio, so more in men than women. And most commonly, it's going to be fusion of the right and the left cusp, or the two coronary cusps, more than the right and non-cusp, more than the left and non-cusp. It's estimated that about 2% will become clinically relevant in adolescence or childhood, meaning 2% of the population and 2% of those we deal with on the pediatric cardiology standpoint, either with a balloon valvuloplasty, aortic valve repair, or some sort of replacement. And we know in pediatrics that the gradient you leave the cath lab with helps predict whether or not you're going to need a future intervention as long as you don't have rip-roaring AI from the procedure. And here's another view from the peristernal long axis. You can see thickening of this cusp. It usually ends up being the right and left cusp with some asymmetry. And although the jet starts symmetrically for aortic insufficiency, it oftentimes ends up being eccentric. When do we need to get involved? When do we need to intervene? It's important that our patients know they're going to be dealing with issues roughly two decades earlier than what we refer to as calcific or senile aortic stenosis, calcific aortic stenosis. So if our older generation parents and grandparents are dealing with their issues in the 70s to 90s, many of these deal with theirs in the 40s to 60s. Growing literature talks about medical management, usually with angiotensin receptor blockers or beta blockers for aortopathy. I put an asterisk next to it. There's not great data just yet, and I take caution using beta blockers when there's a large amount of aortic insufficiency. However, know that it's out there, and uh, a lot of people say, if it can't hurt, might help, maybe it's worth doing. But when it becomes severely stenotic, we do have to consider taking them to the cath lab. And you can do a balloon aortic valvuloplasty if there's little AI and it's not calcified, knowing that the valve will then respond. And the 
Pediatric and interventional guidelines recommend a little bit more aggressively intervening if the peak to peak gradient is 40 millimeters of mercury or 50 millimeters of mercury if it's se severe and symptomatic or if they're considering sports participation or pregnancy. The ACHD guidelines are a little bit more conservative, recommending a 50 millimeter gradient or a 60 millimeter gradient in an asymptomatic patient with EKG changes. Both say that you can bridge if there's hemodynamic instability. The uh, surgical approach, I tend to follow, again, the aortic stenosis and the aortic regurgitation guidelines. We prefer a repair because then you can avoid antiplatelets and anticoagulation. There is a growing debate about using mechanical valves versus tissue valves, and you can't have a discussion about uh, aortic stenosis and bicuspidic valves without talking about the Ross procedure. The Ross procedure shown here is where the diseased aortic valve is going to be taken out and replaced with the pulmonary autograft. Then a homograft is placed into the pulmonary position and the coronary arteries are reimplanted. The largest series of Ross follow-up came earlier this year, and this is from the Quebec uh, uh, series, which it basically shows the degeneration of the autograft at roughly 25 to 30 years out in 310 patients, and about half of them have severe aortic insufficiency by about 25 to 30 years out, which is better than the 10 to 15 years that we usually quote with other tissue homographs in the aortic position about half of them end up getting some sort of intervention. I haven't placed the pulmonary homograft on there because more often that's addressed through catheter means uh, with our percutaneous methods. So where are we now? Is the future now or is the past the present? Two recent publications have come out where they've looked at transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, in patients with bicuspid versus tricuspid aortic valve stenosis. And the patients who had bicuspid aortic valves had a higher percentage, 2% chance of converting to surgery, compared to the 0.2% in the tricomitural aortic valves. Although the mortality was the same, there was more root injury, more paravalvular seat, uh, leak, but the newer transcatheter valves tended to be more neutral uh, with, sir, uh, with uh, tricuspid versus bicuspid aortic valves. And hot off the press from the New England Journal of Medicine, mechanical versus biologic prosthesis for aortic valves, we won't work, talk about the mitral valve replacements now, but the 15-year follow-up in patients aged 40 to 50 showed that there was a 4% mortality increase if you used tissue valves compared to mechanical valves, or a number needed to harm of 25 over that 15 years. Granted, when you look at that series, we're not including the technology of transcatheter aortic valve replacements. So this is from the uh, TAVR article that basically showed if you used the earlier sapiens or core valves, there were higher complications, whereas it really panned out a little bit more neutral, so maybe this is the future of involving aortic stenosis for the bicuspid aortic valve. And from the New England Journal publication, you can see that the tissue valves compared to the mechanical valves, it separates a little earlier in the younger population, separates a little bit later in the older population. But again, the question is gonna end up being, do you wanna trade off the mortality benefit for uh, more strokes, a, uh, sorry, more uh, bleeding, a subset that had a little bit more strokes, and we don't know yet whether or not the transcatheter valve in the surgically placed valve is gonna become the mainstay. When we talk about antibiotic prophylaxis, the 2017 updates uh, basically switched back this category from the 2014 uh, updates. If you've had prior endocarditis, no brainer to do endocarditis prophylaxis as secondary prevention. If you've had an aortic valve replaced, it also said yes, use SB prophylaxis. The 2014 guidelines were leaning away from the repair, suggesting more endothelialization, but it's been moved back up to a 2A indication to use SB prophylaxis in valve repairs, particularly if you think that there's sufficient suture material in there. I think for aortic valve repairs where you just do uh, a incision and open it up a little bit more without new prosthetic material, you could say that after six months, perhaps they could come off SB prophylaxis. Residual shunt, uh, depending on the degree of aortic insufficiency, you're probably already gonna be prophylaxing them if there's uh, some sort of replacement or repair. And then cyanotic disease and transplant valvulopathy really don't apply to this case. It is lifelong surveillance. So in the 2008 adult congenital guidelines, they recommended either annual 
or biannual every two years, EKG and echocardiogram, depending on whether or not the peak gradient was greater than 50 or the mean gradient was greater than 30. So if you thought that we were moving more into the severe picture, um, uh, moderate into severe picture with a greater than 50, greater than 30, they recommended annual follow-ups. And for milder, they recommended every two-year follow-ups with certain specifications for catheterization, treadmill, CT MRI, or stress echo for cases where the echo and the EKG were not diagnostic. The 2014 guidelines, I adhere a little bit more to these, where mild disease I tend to follow every three to five years, moderate disease every one to two, and severe every six to 12 months. The growing theme is that as time has progressed from 2008 to 2014, we tend to be a little bit less uh, aggressive, I believe, in the follow-up of our aortopathy. So let's switch gears and talk about aortopathy. The fusion of the cusps makes a difference. Type 1 is usually fusion of the right and left cusp. It's the most common one. Happens more in uh, older age patients greater than 50. It has mild to moderate aortic root dilation and mild to moderate aortic dilation uh, with aortic stenosis. Type 2 is more associated with the second most common, the right and the non-cusp. It tends to have a little bit more of the aortic and the aortic arch while preserving the aortic root. And type 3 tends to happen more in the young. It's dilation of the aortic root without affecting the ascending aorta. It tends to be more associated with aortic insufficiency, and it tends to be uh, a younger condition under the age of 40 associated with genetic syndromes. It's quoted that roughly 50% of patients with aortic, bicuspid aortic valve will end up with an aortopathy, usually progressive with age. The interesting thing is that there's been no mortality difference. There was a 10-year follow-up study and a 25-year uh, follow-up study, and in those that were asymptomatic, the mortality was the same. There was increased risk of dissection, but it was somewhere between 3 and 10 per 10,000 years, patient years. And therefore, the guidelines say for air, uh, bicuspid aortic valve, use 5.5 centimeters, which is the same as everybody else, because there is not a significant difference in the uh, mortality rate in bicuspid aortic valve to tricuspid ones. However, if there's a high-risk feature, such as a rapidly growing more than half a centimeter per year, or a family history of dissection, go ahead and you can consider replacing the root at five centimeters. Or if you're going to aortic valve surgery, you can go ahead and replace the root at 4.5 centimeters. These are a series of the guidelines. The 2008 and 2010 aorta and ACHD guidelines are reported here. 2014, the valve guidelines are reported here. And these are the 2005 36th uh, Bethesda Conference uh, sports guidelines. And you can see that over just five years, we've gone to doing less of surveillance. Where 3.5 to 4.5 was a annual CT or MRI, we've started just to do surveillance once they clear four centimeters. And this is discussed with the patients, whether it's a two-year follow-up, three-year follow-up, or so. And the semi-annual that started at 4.5 has now recommended to an annual surveillance at roughly tw in 2014, although intervention at 5.5 centimeters is still recommended. All spo sports are allowed under 4 centimeters root uh, size or uh, ascending aorta size, low to moderate, so basketball would be in this category, and only low intensity sports once you go over 4.5 centimeters or golf, perhaps. I tend to be a little bit more uh, aggressive and letting patients participate a little bit more by about a 0.5 centimeter window. That may be a little bit more consistent with the 2014 guidelines, and uh, perhaps if there's a 37th Bethesda, they might move towards that. A couple of special circumstances to talk about, not to steal any thunder about coarctation of the aorta, but bicuspid aortic valves are present in about half to three quarters of patients with coarctation. Thoracic aortic imaging is recommended at least every five years, and head imaging at least once in adulthood is recommended according to the 2008 ACHD guidelines. There is growing literature in Turner syndrome. A 2012 series showed that 95% uh, of patients who were dissecting had bicuspid aortic valves, about 10% of patients with Turner syndrome have a bicuspid aortic valve, and in that series out of 2012, the average uh, size that they dissected was 2.7 plus or minus 0.6 centimeters per meter squared. Turner's patients tend to be a little more petite. Their body surface area is about 1.2 to 1.3. So the patients were dissecting at four to four and a half to five centimeters of aortic uh, diameter. Therefore, when in 2016, when they met in Cincinnati for the Turner syndrome meeting, they recommended using 2.5 centimeters per meter squared as the cut point for involving the aorta.
Here's a couple of the pregnancy guidelines. The Europeans came out with it first in 2011. The Americans updated their scientific statement in 2017, but you'll see that they're very similar. 4.5 or less, World Health Organization uh, class two, maybe assist in the second stage. Consider the C-section if they're 4.5 to 5 centimeter roots, but if they're really greater than 5 centimeter, consider operating before considering pregnancy. Mild to moderate aortic stenosis is well tolerated, and severe uh, asymptomatic aortic stenosis may be well tolerated. Consider an exercise uh, treadmill test. Counsel against severe symptomatic aortic stenosis uh, or intervene prior or during, either with balloon valvuloplasty or an aortic valve replacement, and an early C-section is considered. The last thing I'd like to touch on is the heredity. Notch 1 and ACTA 2 are the genes that are most commonly mentioned. Sometimes it's associated with uh, fibrillin or uh, protein uh, release, matrix metalloprotein release, which leads to disruption and does the jet cause extra distension and uh, degeneration of the aorta. It, even though it's about 2% of the general population, one family member makes it about a 10% association. Two plus, and it becomes familial about one quarter. And that's why the current recommendation from the 2010 guidelines is to screen all first degree relatives uh, with an echo or CTMR looking at the valve and this ascending aorta. There are newer reports that say, is this a cost effective strategy if there is not a mortality difference? So you've heard about it. Eric's denotes insufficiency with a click, Turner syndrome, coarctation, aortic dilation, familial uh, association. It's a valvulopathy that happens earlier. Consider these approaches. Aortopathy, 5.55, 4.5, or 2.5 per meter square, and screen, screen all the first degree relatives. Thank you so much for your time.